Good morning. Morning. Sorry about being a little late. I had the uh, same problem getting on the wrong way. Um, but if people are signed in, yeah. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about education today. And um, as you know, Ray is presenting something a little in a little bit. Uh, let me just clear my screen of some proprietary stuff. Um, sorry. I don't want to throw up the budget. <laughs> it's too painful to look at. Uh, Okay. So, um, education. I, th I guess it goes without saying that it's as much of a core mission of, of ours, education, as is clinical care. Um, and I look at it as a completely uh, 360 degree form of education. Uh, we often speak about how as neurosurgeons, the educational process is active throughout life. You've heard the story of Cal Post saying that even on his last case, he learned something. Uh, last surgical case that he did at Mount Sinai, and that's after more than forty years practicing. Uh, so, in in uh, in this field, one of the things that is the most interesting and the one that keeps it alive is the constant process of discovery and learning. Sometimes it's painful because you can't really learn without some sort of setback. As residents, fellows. Um, of various types, medical students. Of course, the entire focus is on education uh, in, in, in clinical and, and research. And so you get evaluated in and out, up and down. Um, and up until recently, the quality of teaching was maybe a little less emphasized. But over the past decade or so, and more, um, there's been increasing attention on how well people who are in the teaching mode uh, teach and how, how effective they are, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the experience of residents and fellows and medical students. So there's been a lot of work done. Uh, Ray Young has spearheaded a fantastic effort here over the past uh, it's now going on six years or so. I think he started in around 2016. And it's really had a big impact. It really has. Uh, not only in its, um, in its absolute feedback and its uh, you know, hardcore feedback, but also in the attitude that we have towards teaching. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit of what has already happened, where we stand now, the sort of data that I see, and then we're going to turn it over Ray to Ray to give it uh, give it back to him. Um, the The mandate back in 2015 or 16 was find some way to better evaluate us rather than the way we have done it in the past, <clears throat> which for my entire career up until we started this consisted of 
attendings sitting around a room, maybe not all of the attendings, putting up a resident or fellow and saying, well, how did they do? And there would be anecdotes. And somehow those would be conveyed to the program director who would then try to convey it. Um, and that is not, that's not very effective. Uh, so we've, we've tried to improve that. Uh, but even then, we had no way of um, assessing the attending. So now take that same meeting, reduce it. It's not all the attendings. It might be me and a couple of other people or just me. And I'm trying to evaluate how well is an attending achieving our goals of teaching. Um, and the only thing that I would have to go on is hearsay. Oh, well, they like Peter. People, they, they seem to like Peter a lot because of X, Y, and Z. And so I would have a very ill-defined you know, hearsay by which to help Peter improve his, his teaching. Um, and so that's, that's where Ray came in, in uh, looking at the world's literature, and he found the system, the SETQ questionnaire, modified system of evaluation of teaching qualities. Um, and it divides the categories into, into seven categories, learning climate, professional attitude, learner centeredness. So if you're in the operating room, are we just think, thinking about the case? Are we also thinking about the people, the students who are in there who need to learn, learn from this? And that doesn't have to be just residents. Evaluation of the resident and feedback from the resident. Um, and then since we're in a healthcare system, uh, practice management and, and finally role modeling. And then added to it some uh, positive, constructive, um, and sometimes critical comments to that. At Sinai, this has evolved, but Ray has divided the uh, the big system into these five groups that you could see here. Uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, West and Morningside, Elmhurst, and then system-wide neurocritical care and endovascular. Uh, the responses, you know, you'd love to have it on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, but our rotations are generally three to six, three to six months, or sometimes a little longer. So we collect data every six months. And uh, there are three groups currently being evaluated. We have discussed the possibility of expanding of extending this um, to other groups. And ultimately, I'd love to see this extended to other groups, such as the APPs. Um, you have to have interacted with an attending and the trainee at least once, once a month anything less than that, and it just doesn't seem valid. Um, and then that that interaction has to have been meaningful, 124 data points. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. Obviously, we want to have data that is valid, but we also really are trying to maintain anonymity. And if you only were with someone for one month, it might decrease the anonymity. Uh, those 30 some odd questions uh, are scored um, and you can get a maximum of 220. We've gone back and forth in our group as to how to judge the grades. First there's a grade, but then how do you categorize that? Um, and so these are the numbers uh, that we have used, that there should be a, a, a minimum expectation of 190. And if you get 210 or, or more, that's, you know, that's a good score. And this came out of looking at the data to see how the spread fell. Again, change this so that everyone is either not doing well or everyone's doing great. So this is where the data fell. Um, we also have tried to prioritize the surgical teaching. And so uh, there, are, there are some questions here that are on, on the questionnaire that are 
focused on surgery, uh, taught surgical skills, provided responsibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And until you have read these for the first time as attending, uh, you don't necessarily think about this, right? What you think about is going into the operating room, showing a resident uh, or someone, you know, how good a surgeon you are and leaving. Uh, but you have to sometimes go a little bit beyond that. Um, so again, using the data that we got, uh, we have set a minimum expectation of 34 on the teaching scale. Um, as you know, the Dean and many other medical centers throughout the country have adopted this method of judging, our, judging the faculty members in a big AMC. Uh, so this is not just Mount Sinai, this is, this is nationwide. Um, there's a certain set of criteria by which you would meet the expectations of the department and of the institution. And you could exceed those expectations or fall, fall short. Uh, so for the teaching, uh, we have set uh, the score at 190 in at least one of the two cycles that we average each, each, uh, each time. Um, with a 34 on the surgical teaching. If you get below 190 in one or both cycles, that's below expectations. And we don't really like to see anyone getting below 180 in, in any of the cycles. <clears throat> so taking the names out, here's what I get from Ray. Um, and what you see here is a, what I think is a nice distribution of um, doing well, and then opportunities for improvement um, with the scores below 190. So here you see, here's data back since 2017. And uh, one thing you'll notice is that, um, and Ray's gonna get into this, there do appear to be two sets of data here, two, or two types of data. Uh, one in which the scores are relatively consistent, and another in which the scores vary a lot. And so this concept of variance is something that Ray has looked into. Um, this is what it looks like for each attending who, um, so I see all this and then each attending, <clears throat> Ray sees it and then each attending will then get this report here that shows how they've done the last three scoring cycles. Um, this is the so-called Z-score setting the mean at zero and then your cumulative score that is translated into uh, a Z-score. Are you above or below the standard deviation of the rest of the group? So this is a continually internally looking score uh, that allows us to measure how we're doing uh, from year to year. And there are some problems with this without a doubt, but um, this particular, you know, what's, when I look at this, I say, well, okay, this particular attending is doing pretty well. Um, you know, not spectacular because a greater, a standard deviation of more than one is probably significant. Anything less than 0.5 may just be kind of white noise. So this attending is doing reasonably well, but there are some areas here where they could use a little help. So let's look at let's look at question number 15. What does it say? Taught residents how to deal with competing personal and professional demands. Okay. Um, how about uh, 26? Taught organizational aspects of nurse of surgical practice. Definitely did not do as well in that. So you can see here um, that the areas where this attending could stand to look at their practice of teaching. Um, on the other hand, they did pretty well on the teaching here. Here's another one who, um, so here, you know, here there's definitely opportunity for improvement. Um, I don't just look at the direction, but I also look at what's happened. And what you can see here, which I like, is that almost across the trend, 
this attending is improving over the past year and a half. And so I think this is, you know, relatively, you know, relatively positive, even though there clearly is a little room for improvement. But also on the surgical score, this attending is improving from below expectations to meeting expectations. So I find this extremely useful. Uh, the JNS like this, this is Ray's first article among what will end up being many articles. And these are some of the things that he reported. Um, you know, he couldn't really, re he couldn't really uh, publish this until there had been accumulation of data over time. And so what uh, one of the most important things that he was able to report was the change in scoring over time. Um, and so he looked at a whole host of different factors. And here you can see the two areas where there was the most change in a positive direction. And that was professionalism and practice management. The other thing that he's looking at he looked at then, and he's now going to present us today something uh, additional on this, is variance. How much do scores vary? We're kind of, we are kind of looking for consistency in our teaching. And so this downward trend is an improvement because there's less variance. Um, students, learners should have a relatively consistent experience. Uh, and this is this really, uh, I think, is positive because it looks like we've improved a little bit on these important characteristics of surgical skills and so on. He's going to report uh, today on a little on on some of the other characteristics. So we hypothesized that gender, race, age, rank, background, specialty, site, um, and other things might have a systematic impact on the perceived quality of teaching. I thought this was very interesting. Um, and I also thought these, these data are very interesting. Gender, race, age, back, cultural background, specialty, whether or not you were a surgeon or a critical care attending, for example, had no impact. I actually thought that, you know, all of these would have an impact, but they had no impact according to the people who filled this out. Um, whereas uh, there, there, is a, there is a trend um, in rank and Ray will get into that. So how, you know, how, uh, you know, what your rank is as a, an attending, uh, the hospitals, but I think this is probably just a reflection of uh, who, who's at which hospital. Um, and then um, consistency, consistency. This report every cycle is the consistency of the exposure of the residents had an impact. Um, now we're not we're not assuming that there's causation here, but an observation was made that over the time period 2015, which was before it, the, the survey. Uh, to 2020, there was a significant improvement in the primary exam scores without a corresponding change in the USMLE scores. So this was not, this is sort of internally controlled for the test-taking ability of the, uh, the residents. So this implies that there's some, if not causation, but that something, that's a, something is occurring in the residency that's leading to an improvement in primary exam scores. Um, as you know, there are multiple surveys that you fill out and we fill out. Um, and so the other survey that you fill out is your ACGME uh, score. And I will meet privately with you residents about this because this is, a, this is more important than you realized. And, or you may, you, maybe you do realize, but I wanna discuss it with you. But we did see an improvement in this as well. So I, as you know, I think this is a really wonderful effort by Ray, and uh, we all have a lot to learn from it. Rather than opening it up to comments now, I think it would be good to turn it over to Ray so we can hear what he has to say about it. Thank you. 
Let me just pull up my slides here. <clears throat> okay, is that projecting correctly? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay, so um, yeah, so we left it off here at the um, a little bit about um, the individualized reports, um, which I think um, uh, most of us who've been, uh, you know, participating in this program uh, for the last few years are are fairly familiar with uh, by now you know, what these numbers mean and um, you know how to interpret your own data. Um, you know, one of the gaps that um, you know I've noticed over the last um, you know several uh, years, you know, maybe not so much at the beginning when uh, maybe you know residents were more um, attuned to this, but it was. It was the, the the feedback aspect, and um, I think I think this is one of the more uh, the most useful um, aspects of the report are the are the direct comments that are that are provided uh, by the various trainees. Um, you know what what exactly you're doing right, what exactly you're doing wrong, and um, you know it varies a lot. Um, you know there there are some comments that are I think very very specific, and um, you know probably useful uh, for the attendings to hear. And then you know there are other kind of sort of you know one word comments that you know, that may be less uh, detailed, and then um, you know just the number of comments in general, um, and whether uh, to the attending this seems to really match the quantitative data, and so an attending may be confused you know to see that their scores are lower and not really have any comments that are you know critical or or in a constructive sort of mode, um, and so. Uh, to kind of fill in these these gaps, you know, we understand that the residents may may be somewhat reluctant to 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 put in very detailed, you know, specific anecdotes, uh, which may be very very helpful to attendings. But attendings are immediately going to recognize, you know, uh, wh where that comes from and who's writing the uh, the comment. Um, you know, rather than try to uh, you know push into that more, uh, I thought that well maybe we can look into the data, you know, the quantitative data to kind of give us a little bit more information about um, you know why, you know, what are the drivers between uh, of, of the scores, and and if you are in a uh, you know struggling, you know, or or having a lot of variance, seeing a lot of variance in your scores from year to year, and you're not really sure why, maybe we can provide some more information about exactly you know what the driving forces are uh, of that so just to get back a little bit to the overall data first um we uh, are seeing very good data so you know this 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 last cycle we're now at the 12th cycle of this um actually is the most data collected you know since the beginning of the program back in in 2017 so we saw a significant uptick um, in the number of surveys that were completed, this translates into a larger number of complete reports for faculty, which is this, this is very important in the concept of, of exposure and getting uh, feedback every cycle so that actual change uh, is possible. And then um, this also translates to a lower number of partial reports, you know, partial reports being, you know, the faculty is told that, well, there's not enough sufficient data today or this cycle and you need to work a little bit more at engaging with the residents. And that's really all they're, they're told um, with a partial report. So not, not quite as useful for the attending if, if not enough residents or trainees have completed a survey for them. And uh, you saw this uh, chart um, that JV showed in terms of the overall um, uh, trends uh, over the entire life uh, span of the program. Uh, a little bit difficult to, you know, you do make, seem to make out some, some um, trends here, uh, like a sort of a tightening of the scores sort of in the middle portion of the, the program a few years back, but then maybe a, a slight increase in the variance uh, more recently. So I took a closer look at this, and instead of, you know, looking, you know, cycle by cycle at the bottom here on the x-axis, uh, I normalized this so that we're looking at instead the number of reports received by each each attending. So if you've received 12, you know, cycles, you know, one every cycle for the last um, 
you know, 12 cycles, then your, your, your line goes all the way out to the end. Whereas if you just started in the program, you know, you're, you're somewhere over here. Uh, and so this, this does actually uh, show more of a trend that, uh, you know, attendings who have received fewer reports, you know, are, tend to be in this category where there's going to be more uh, variance. And we can see that, you know, seems to be happening that you start in the program, uh, you may have a very low score at first, but you fairly quickly within about four to five cycles, five to four to five reports, uh, make the corrections. And so this, this is, I think, um, definite evidence that uh, the report, the feedback is, is working. Uh, attendings are, are looking at this um, and introspecting and, uh, you know, kind of discovering, you know, what, what they can change uh, within their power to, to make the improvement and get above this, this dotted line. And looking at this uh, in more detail, breaking it down further, this is a chart of uh, each attending here, each bar is each attending, and the, uh, the amount of fluctuation that they're seeing in their score cycle to cycle on average. So, you know, this is attending, you know, 30 points change in the score, huge change. Um, you know, so one cycle, they could be, you know, in the 160s and in the next cycle, 190s, um, uh, down to, say, this, this attending at the very bottom here, where there's only a, you know, two point, three point change per, per cycle. So it's an enormous difference here. And you can almost see kind of these, these steps um, in this uh, waterfall plot. And, uh, you know, you can see these step offs. And this is how I've sort of uh, decided to look at categorizing and looking closer into, into the patterns within, within the overall data. So in everybody's report, uh, when it was possible, this past cycle, so this is the end of February, uh, everyone received an email with their, with their actual spreadsheet. Uh, in the email message, I, I denoted uh, you know, which, which category uh, your, your pattern was in as an attending. Um, so you were A, B, C, D, corresponding to the degree of uh, variance cycle to cycle in your report. So we'll just go in a little bit into what, what, what differs between these categories. Okay, so this is the categories uh, colored on the, uh, on the uh, chart. So you can see that the D category, lowest variance here, tends to be sort of here at the, at the top. Um, you know, there, there's some, you know, uh, width you know, to the height of these, uh, where these bars lie. So not necessarily the very, very top, but, you know, there's some that are very consistent, but um, a little bit lower. And then uh, the red and orange, A and B, are, are the ones where there has been the most um, fluctuation, tend to be lower scores, you know, overall, if you, if you sum or average everything. Um, and we'll break this down further. So um, first of all, you know, for the entire data sets, looking at everything combined, um, we did an analysis that was part of the 2021 paper, um, but is also ongoing in terms of, you know, looking at um, the fluctuations and correlating those with the changes that we see in every single of the 30, uh, 31 items in the survey. And we're looking for the R squared, the, the degree of correlation uh, between the change in that item and the change in the overall score that the attending uh, is seeing. And uh, I presented this previously, um, but uh, this is sort of solidified in our more recent data, looking at over, overall the entire uh, life lifespan of the program. That evaluation of the trainee, you know, actually critically looking at you know what the trainee is doing um, in the learning session and and uh, paying attention to that. Uh, the learner centeredness, as JB mentioned, um, are you are we you know orienting uh, the the operating room, the learning session? Um, as a way to um, address uh, learning points that are important uh, to, to the trainee um, and trying to find out, you know, what exactly those trainees are trying to get out of the learning session and then providing feedback. So, you know, after all this has happened, after you evaluated, after you've created a, a learning environment, um, can you deliver back to the trainee how they did, what they're going to do better next time, and in a such a way that you know they're motivated to uh, continue to learn. So those are the three most important categories for the overall uh, data. So we now look at pattern A, the the, the largest fluctuators, um, and that's their their trend line here on the left. 
And we see that in addition to those three uh, you know, core sort of uh, categories, evaluation, feedback, and centeredness, what also pops in is professionalism. And um, what also pops in is the learning climate. So uh, and I'll get into a little bit more about um, what these uh, you know, actual categories mean, but this is uh, to do with um, uh, being available to the, to the resident, uh, to the trainees um, in terms of uh, being available and ready to sort of teach and engage, and also um, uh, you know, treating them in a, in a respectful manner. So that's, that's sort of uh, the, the, the question 11 here on the, on the survey. Survey here. Yeah, so 11 specifically is, is approachability, this concept of approachability during the uh, uh, during both daytime hours and, and, uh, and on call. Uh, we look at, at, at pattern B, um, so a little bit less uh, fluctuations. And while pattern A seemed to be kind of on this sort of overall upward trend, these attendings are responding to this and, and making, making corrections, uh, you know, pattern B is a little bit more flat um, in that there are fluctuations. Um, you know, there may be some, you know, tightening here of the variance in the middle, but, um, you know, sort of up and down. So, um, you know, these attendings actually may, may, may be having a little bit more difficulty in pinpointing exactly what they need to do uh, to stay above, um, you know, the expectation line. And so professionalism drops out, becomes less important here. Uh, but, you know, it's perhaps true that uh, they need to uh, focus more on creating um, the learning climate uh, that's needed. So learning climate here, three and five, were motivating residents um, to study and learn further. And then five is um, that the attending show uh, good preparation in terms of, of their teaching sessions. So um, this, this speaks to, uh, you know, for example, didactic seemingly prepared or leading group sessions, uh, maybe having an organized way of going through cases um, in the OR or at the bedside. Uh, pattern C um, generally, you know, are, are above the expectation line, but here it seems like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a fairly tight variance at the outset, um, but this may be slackening a little bit as things, as things go on. So overall less um, uh, you know, variance, but, um, you know, I think that this, these attendings may have to focus on maintaining, you know, what they're doing um, and, uh, you know, adjusting and, you know, making smaller, you know, changes in their, in their teaching. Um, and what popped into this category seemed to be role modeling as, as, the, um, as, as the one driving factor that was not present in uh, the other patterns. Um, so here, you know, the role modeling items are, you know, role modeling as a teacher, as a supervisor, role modeling as a, as a clinician, um, and then um, sort of a general one as kind of role model as a person. So these are sort of, you know, whether the trainee kind of looks to you to, um, uh, you know, be a model of all of the, you know, so-called correct behaviors and characteristics of a, of a, uh, of a clinician educator. And then as expected, pattern D, uh, with lowest variance, you know, there, there was nothing really, no specific item that popped above, uh, you know, the 0.7 uh, correlation coefficient here. So, so these, these attendings are uh, sort of more in that uh, the maintenance, you know, they, they're, they're consistent, uh, they're maintaining uh, what they're doing, and it, there's not a huge amount of uh, fluctuation, and they're generally all above the um, expectation line here. So sort of putting this all together, you know, there seems to be sort of like a hierarchy of, of the items of the categories that's that's emerging um, that, uh, you know, may help us <coughs> pinpoint for each attending in each category, each pattern here, you know, what what needs to be the focus um, uh, in terms of, of uh, remediating or improving uh, the performance. And it begins, you know, at the bottom of the of the you know, sort of stack here with professionalism and addressing uh, those concerns. Uh, and then uh, the learning climate, uh, creating the environment um, uh, where the learners are comfortable and stimulated to learn, uh, you know, role modeling, uh, you know, the appropriate behaviors um, and characteristics of the clinician educator, 
And then you go into this maintenance phase where you need to evaluate you know, the trainees. You need to con continue to create um, and address their uh, goals as learners and then provide feedback to, um, to maintain a consistent teaching um, practice. And then uh, we looked, or are still looking into, you know, whether there are different uh, uh, characteristics of attendings that predict uh, what pattern um, they may be in. Uh, nothing has really emerged so far, but we're going to be adding, you know, more characteristics into uh, the independent variables here um, to look at. Um, and so the other uh, update that we're looking at for the program overall is to address, you know, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so um, this is sort of my, uh, my thoughts, and I'd like to hear, you know, from the group as well about, you know, how we can uh, better modify, address uh, these issues uh, while uh, kind of maintaining the, the statistics and the analysis here overall. So we don't want to change, you know, the total number of points, 220, uh, by adding necessarily more um, uh, items, but maybe we want to relook at relook some of these items and see if they can be modified to to address these concerns. So within professional attitude, for example, you know, um, you know, we have two questions right now about approachability. Um, so it's it's very important, but I think you know these maybe can be rolled into one where you know rather than between on call and daytime work, we're looking more at you know are they just approachable during daytime and on call hours. And then um, to add into professional attitude, um, you know, teaching in a manner that is free from conscious or unconscious bias, so that the that the uh, the learner feel that there was you know any conscious or unconscious bias um, on the part of the teacher. And then another opportunity for us to to better address diversity and inclusion under professional practice management uh, would be. Uh, some of the content of our teaching of professional practice. So rather than the current question, creating awareness of the economic aspects of neurosurgical care, are we maybe better able to create awareness of some of the socioeconomic determinants of health in the context of neurosurgery? So th these are, I think, two uh, possibilities um, for how we can alter uh, some of the questions to better address these issues um, uh, that we can integrate into the next evaluation cycle. Uh, I think uh, there's also been discussion about uh, you know better recognition of our our excellent um, faculty uh, mentors uh, who have really you know performed well you know and consistently through the entire lifespan of the program and um, uh, so th so the thought is to recognize this annually for uh, the best surgical, our interventional teacher, as well as another award for uh, best uh, medical teacher, specifically um, looking at our um, critical care um, colleagues. And then on the flip side, you know, we want to also um, have tools available for um, remediation. Um, and uh, although I think the tool itself, this questionnaire itself, you know, provides a very, you know, very valuable feedback, and many attendings have been able to integrate their feedback and actually translate this into, um, you know, very dramatic improvements um, in the performance. This this has not you know, been the case for everyone, and I think uh, we we could as a group do more for you know the faculty who are just maybe entering the program. Uh, but struggling a little bit with the scores and uh, just doing a little bit of research in our um, own uh, hospital here, the Institute for Medical Education and the Office of Faculty Development actually provide uh, sessions um, um, sort of on order uh, in each of these areas and more. Um, and some of them are very relevant, I think, to um, you know, the areas uh, that are highlighted by the different patterns. So how do you give effective feedback how do you um, uh, evaluate learners in a way that is meaningful? Um, we're surgeons and interventionists, so you know we we are all about how do you cram a lot of high you know value teaching into a short amount of time? Um, you know, in the <laughs> turnovers between cases and uh, that that sort of thing, and then um, and then how do we deal with 
uh, you know, learners who don't seem to be as engaged? How do we how do we stimulate that? Uh, how do we motivate them to to uh, to learn uh, to more and to um, you know initiate their own uh, uh, learning, etc. So um, th that's what I had in terms of um, slides, and um, would love to uh, have a little discussion about um, uh, what other faculty, what the what the residents think uh, about uh, the patterns and um, uh, these suggestions for for changing the program. Terrific. It's better. Each year it gets better. I love the way you've distilled down the influences on variation and how um, in one case, the influence is a negative influence that that the professionalism, if you've got that as the driver, you're going to be not scoring uh, as well. But as you start to get into role modeling and so on, it it, it elevates. So I think that's wonderful. And I also like the fact there's something now that we can refer each other to, to uh, for improvement. You know, it'd yeah, be nice yeah. to have uh, the other thing that I'd love to do. It may get a little tough, is to have something for residents and fellows within the training period, because a lot of what you do as residents and fellows is teach one another, and. Um, there's nothing that creates more esprit de corps and a better experience for the, the whole resident team if the seniors are teaching the juniors and the and the seniors are open to being taught by the juniors who might have the right observations. So there's all kinds of work that still needs to be done to make this an even better experience for everyone. I saw there was a raised hand there. Does someone have a question? Yeah, I, if I can, it was me, but I'm, I, I see I'm panelist now. So a few things. I think, you know, the, it, it's a big credit, Ray, to perhaps maybe people don't realize how much work, time, energy goes into the construction of these surveys, analysis, and really it's a high validation model. And that's that's a big compliment, Ray, to all the work and analysis that you do. This is on a national scale. Um, I, I don't know of, and any other place that does such a vigorous analysis so it's a it's certainly a credit rate to all you've done i think if i can comment just on what i've seen over my, over the years is that i think you know the learning environment has changed and, and i you the residents know i talk about this all the time we're now in a mode of intentional learning which means you try to think about each engagement with faculty and each other as opportunities for learning because of work hour restrictions and other things Every every um, opportunity has the potential for really significant engagement. So for faculty, I would say the way I would view this is how do we maximize those engagement opportunities? You know, most of us as surgeons are in the OR, but there are other opportunities through the didactic work and other things. But I think what I've told myself, um, at least speaking from my own experiences, to really use that opportunity in the OR mostly as as a longitudinal way to to continue engagement so that could include the discussions the day before and i think most one of the most important things which um you know i don't do as often which i think all of us can do better probably is the debrief after the surgery in terms of you know hey these are the things which i think you know can be improved these are the learning points and so forth so i would i would view i think one of the best things about this is viewing things as educational opportunities and each engagement is being important and then i would just say as as residents what for you all what i think is is important too is just to continue to really think about these i know these are several data points but the impact is significant and i think it changes the structure and the programming that we have so you know the other thing i would just end by saying is for faculty please let me know if there are ways that i can help all of you let myself know let chris dr betterson whoever about ways we can create those kind of maybe more structured engagement opportunities for all of you. So, I mean, I think this is fantastic. Thank you. Do you have any other comments, um, either from faculty or residents about this uh, process? All 
All right. Thank you, Ray, for presenting that again. We'll look forward to the every, I guess, semi-annual uh, or biannual update on this. Yeah, another, another two months will be between us again. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, next up is um, something that Raj um, is really Raj's idea and was conceived as a uh, um, as an opportunity for us to look at interesting and controversial questions in neurosurgery and various subspecialties. Um, all of us attend annual meetings, and so we see these point-counterpoint discussions where you get two experts up on the panel and debate a topic um, that for which the question, there are still a number of unanswered questions. Um, you know, I think of this as an academic opportunity, but also as a um, really a a battle of titans, uh, a clash of heavyweights, in this case, two future heavyweights in spine surgery. Um, we have our, our two chief residents getting up today. Uh, we have Travis. Um, all, all of you know their, their backgrounds, um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each side um, and Frank, um, but, but really the way, I, the way I look at this is, is more of this picture. Um, we've got a, a match to end all matches. Uh, discussing uh, expandable versus non-expandable T-lift cages uh, or static T-lift cages. So uh, Frank and Travis, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and hopefully you can come to some interesting conclusions and I'm gonna elevate the spine faculty who are interested in commenting uh, later and then we can open it up to discussion. Thanks, that was a great introductory slide. Uh, so uh, we're gonna talk about expandable versus st uh, static TLA cages. Um, I'm on the, the pro expansion uh, side, uh, no disclosures. Uh, just some you know, background context and uh, adult spinal deformity and degenerative conditions of the spine. You know, the literature really, really supports uh, maintaining or improving uh, lumbar lordosis. So we're trying to get the, the maximum that you can out of the, the, the cage that you're inserting. And you know, while, while T-lift is a you know great operation, you, you can do a, a direct decompression. It's versatile. You can access every uh, lumbar uh, inner space. Um, it's you know you're not putting as big a cage as Lordaka cage as you possibly could uh, from an A-lift or even a, a lateral uh, type of approach. Uh, you're limited by the the local anatomy and the small exposure, relatively smaller exposure you get with T-lift. Uh, this is supported by uh, literature um, and meta-analyses and direct comparisons, people are finding you know more lordosis with A-lifts, more uh, slip reduction, height restoration with o with O-lift, and um, it's mainly because one one um, you know one factor is that you have such a small working window for, for putting your cage. So this is just a picture of Cayman's triangle. You you only have you know about a centimeter of, of working room. Uh, between you and the nerve root and the and the, and the pedicles uh, to get your cage in, and in a you know, typical MIS type of um, T lift, this is kind of what what you see in this upper left hand corner. You have uh, you have dura medially, you have the traversing nerve root, you have the exiting nerve root, and this is kind of where you can put your cage in. So you know there's brought with all possible um, possibilities uh, with complications. Uh, you're working around nerve roots, so you can have neurologic injuries. You're working around the fecal sac, you can get you get durotomies and CS, CSF leaks. Um, you you may intend to put a lordotic cage in or create a lordotic configuration, but you can you know still end up with uh, post T lift kyphosis like this uh, uh, example here, and then other you know disasters like the cage can migrate back. You know if you if you're trying to um, you know, scrape the implant to get a bigger cage in, you may you may damage it. And, end up with an immediate or delayed uh, subsidence of the cage. Uh, there are a few you know, you know, techniques with design and, and placement of the cages that may help with this um, in terms of uh, trying to put a bigger cage in, a banana type um, articulating cage to get maybe a little, um, little more um, width coverage, uh, creating cages that are more lordotic or have more room for, for graft. Um, but this is about the only real options you, you have uh, currently with cage design. And when you're thinking about uh, cases where, the, you know, the, the disc space is, is totally collapsed, you want to restore some height, you want to get uh, lordosis, 
you want to basically expand the anterior column to create more lodotic configuration. Um, gets in this concept of maybe we could put a, you know, a slightly smaller cage in initially and then uh, expand it uh, to, create some, to create some more height, uh, to create a scenario where uh, you're going from a, a Robbie Rothrock uh, uh, configuration to more of a, a Texan uh, Kurt and Justin uh, uh, height expansion. Uh, so this is uh, your, your standard um, a bullet static uh, T lift cage. Uh, here, here are two um, expandable uh, cages that we use at uh, at Sinai. Uh, this is the pro lift cage in the middle. Uh, it ex expands um, mainly in height, like you can see here. And the other one is the tie hawk uh, cage by uh, the Flare Hawk Company, which uh, expands both in height um, and also in in width. Uh, so you um, hypothetically can create more um, uh, fusion surface area in addition to. Uh, elevating the height of the, of the cage. Uh, this is one such uh, case that uh, Dr. Magas and I did this year, a patient uh, with his uh, spondylolisthesis. Uh, we placed the uh, expandable cage. Uh, he had a great outcome, it was discharged and was um, feeling well and then follow up. This is just one example of the power of using expandable technology. Uh, a few things that I, uh, I like about using, using expandable cages, um, you can, um, uh, get uh, uh, higher graminal interframinal distance to de to indirectly uh, decompress the nerve root um, at the level that you're operating on. You can get uh, better uh, segmental correction of lordosis or at least maintenance of lordosis, and then um, overall uh, lumbar lordosis. I, I think you can get um, a better result with expandable cage uh, and the and cages that expand uh, in width. Uh, you're uh, in increasing greatly the fusion surface area, the in-plate contact. So I think that you can get a better uh, fusion um, using expandables. And I'll show in the literature that the fusion rates are about the same. And the, the real um, key, I think, is that you, you don't have to, uh, you know, take away as much local anatomy. You know, in degenerative conditions and uh, deformity conditions, you're not you're not working on normal anatomy. You're working and collapsed spaces, very narrow. Maybe the facets are uh, very enlarged. It's hard to, to get a conventional uh, type cage in. So you may have to do less uh, bony uh, work or soft tissue work. And so that you know leads us to the, the concept that this is a, the ideal type of cage to use uh, for MIS spine surgery, uh, such as uh, Dr. Steinberger's uh, practice. However, my, you know, my partner might have a different type of uh, opinion on um, what MIS uh, really means. Uh, this is just a you know, picture of some um, data points people looked at in the literature, uh, looking at the measuring the disc height uh, before and after the, the cage is placed, both anterior and posterior, uh, the foraminal height, which is the distance between the lower end of this pedicle and the um, upper end of this pedicle here. And measuring the fusion, the uh, decompression surface area. Uh, this is all pretty uh, standardized literature, and there's been you know tons of studies on this. Uh, here's one direct comparison: a, a large series of static versus expandable cages. Uh, three bar graphs here. Um, the black uh, bars are for static cages, and the white are for expandable. Uh, the left one is the base, the baseline uh, height of the, of the disk space. Uh, this is uh, this middle um, bar is uh, immediately after the cage, and then this this uh, third one is uh, a delayed uh, follow up. And they found that you have a huge difference in the disc height uh, that you can get with expandable cages, um, in addition to uh, foraminal height, um, both um, immediately and in long term. They also, um, the same study, they looked at the amount of uh, lordosis that they were getting uh, with a static versus expandable cages. And uh, they found that they were getting much better results in, in their hands in terms of lordosis, both at the segment that they're fusing and then the uh, overall uh, lumbar lordosis. There've been a, a few meta-analyses. There's, there's not a lot of um, great literature on, on the direct comparisons, but there, there are a few. And um, in the largest of analyses uh, that looked at um, direct comparisons of expandable to non-expandable cages, um, most people are finding 
more lidosis um, based on these, these fissure plots, uh, forest plots. Um, and then uh, in terms of disc height, maybe a slight uh, benefit actually to um, static cages, um, but uh, just barely uh, significant. Overall fusion rates are about the same, maybe a, a slight um, nudge toward um, static cages having higher fu uh, fusion rates. Uh, there are a few te techniques you can do with expandable cages to try to improve this. If you, if you think about it, you're putting in, you're putting in a small cage and then you're expanding it. So you're not able to um, pack it with bone graft immediately where, um, as Frank will show on static cages where you can just, you can just, you know, pack a, a large cage and, and put that in. But there, there are techniques you can, you pack the disc space before uh, with bone graft and then you can use these, these funnels that, ins that uh, insert into the uh, expansion uh, port of the cage and you can post pack it. So you can really, um, I think, put a similar amount of uh, bone graft as you would with a static. Uh, there's only been a few studies on looking at uh, patients that require a repeat operation. And um, the literature says that there's basically um, basically no difference in terms of uh, reoperation rates between expandable and static cages. Um, similarly, the uh, subsidence rate is uh, surprisingly um, uh, the same. Um, there's a study at UCSF, and they, they found that when they when they were started adding a, a contralateral uh, posterior column um, osteotomy and release, that they took their uh, subsidence rate um, from um, about 27 percent in expandable cage down down to five percent, uh, more similar to a uh, static cage. Um, so just, just you know, concept that if you de if you um, if you free up the, the facets and maybe some of the, the, uh, the expansion force isn't disrupting the end plate as much, if you are thoughtful about that. Only a few studies have been done on um, symptomatic outcomes, quality of life and pain. Uh, and a few, uh, here's like five studies uh, in this meta-analysis and they found overall that your back pain, your leg pain is about the same if you put an expandable or a static cage. Uh, but your um, disability index may be a little bit better um, with expandable. Um, one one uh, common critique of using expandables is that they they're overall you know more expensive. Uh, they're you know, relatively newer technology. Um, it's you know still it's you know rel still relatively new. Um, manufacturing is still not 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 quite there. Um, but I'd like to just uh, you know highlight that. Um, you know, as technology progresses and, and economies of scale uh, occur, um, both in healthcare and in this this uh, example, you know, Moore's law, uh, which, which basically says that uh, the microprocessors that are using computers are uh, getting um, better, but the cost of them are going down. I think we'll probably see a similar uh, trend. And uh, just another thing to highlight is you know the uh, new technology adoption curve. Uh, where it goes from uh, the first people using it are like the innovators and the early adopters. And I think we're right, right around here, the early majority with expandable cages. What you don't want to be is the, the laggards on the other side, uh, which, uh, you know, Frank may fall into. We'll see. Um, and then just my last, uh, my last point for, for my, um, my point of view is be thoughtful of, you know, what, what you're goals of surgery are and what you could possibly do to a, to a patient if you don't you know, give them the right alignment from the, the index surgery. Uh, here are two examples of uh, patients that were fused flat uh, from you know, small, uh, small su surgeries with uh, T-lip cages and they uh, developed um, significant uh, deformities, um, positive sagittal balance, flat back. Um, so I just wanna, remind people that you know every every surgery has a potential of being a deformity surgery either creating one or um having to fix one which you might might want to call frank for this one and that's my point of view i'll turn it over to frank all right thanks travi um my intro slide still said I'm a sixth year resident and I had a flash of like PTSD, hopefully. <laughs> but I'll be arguing for, uh, for static T-list cages uh, and why we should use them. 
uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, Travis talked about what a T-lift really is. It's a, a transframinal lumbar antibody fusion. It's a, usually used as a supplement to posterior lateral fusion. Uh, these are usually the cuts that you have to make to access the disc uh, in Cambridge Triangle. Um, a lot of the benefits uh, Travis mentioned include removing the actual herniated disc if there is one. You get direct decompression of the ipsilateral foramen, indirect decompression of the contralateral foramen. You, know, you can reduce, somewhat reduce uh, central stenosis through ligamental taxis of stretching of the PLL, correction of any spondylolisthesis and uh, increasing the rate of fusion. Uh, so there's two major types uh, that we already mentioned, expandable and the static cages. And uh, we all know Travis is a huge proponent of getting a lift. So uh, <clears throat> subsidence, and but that's one of the most important things about uh, uh, T-lifts is, is avoiding subsidence, which is a loss of disc height or disc space when the implant migrates into the vertebral bodies. Uh, and this can lead to uh, a redu reduction in lumbar lordosis, a worsening of the foraminal stenosis uh, that you were once trying to correct. Uh, it also reduces the rate of fusion and re often requires revision surgery. You can think of subsidence as, uh, you know, Travis being in quicksand. Once you break the surface, surface tension, uh, you're gonna, that graft is probably gonna sink. Um, static cages actually have lower rates of subsidence versus expandables in this uh, series in Jana's spine. Um, uh, it's actually the same study that Travis just recently showed. Uh, the cage subsidence is significantly higher in expandable group, 19.7% uh, versus just 5%. Um, and even within the expandable group, the uni just the unilateral fastectomy group had 5.6%. Uh, uh, times higher subsidence rate, and uh, usually in MIS surgery, when you use expandable t lift cages, you're not releasing the contralateral facet unless you drop a tube on the other side and do that. And even within this, even with it, when this within this uh, series, uh, they had four of their 62 expandable cages collapse, which is a six percent complication rate, which is extremely high. Uh, so expand cages, although initially they may have a better foraminal height restoration, initially in the long run, this was likely negated by uh, the increased rates of subsidence over a year prior to the patient fusing. And, um, and the theory is that expansion of that T-lift cage uh, breaks through the cortical surface, either intraoperatively or postoperatively when the patient uh, uh, bears weight or loads uh, weight onto their, uh, to their spine. Uh, which leads to subsidence. And cage collapse, expandable cages can collapse unlike static cages, and this occurs one to 10% of the time. Uh, even in that series, 6% seems extremely high uh, complication rate. And uh, once it collapses, the cage is essentially left floating in the disc space with high risk of uh, kicking out into the neural foramen. And uh, this will require revision surgery. In this case, uh, they did they did an anterior operation where they yanked out the disc, uh, sorry, the graft from the front, and then they put a, a lift cage in. Um, and so these uh, in expandable T lift cages, they essentially have no intraoperative control of graft height. Uh, so most T lift cages expand to a set height set by the uh, the manufacturer, and usually is not ad adjustable. For example, if you shave the end plates down to what ten millimeter shaver. Uh, but the cage expands from an eight to a 13, uh, you're likely gonna fracture the end plates once you've fully expanded it to 13. There are a few expandable T-lift cages like the ProLift uh, and the Forza cages the, um, where you can control its height. However, you, you don't know how much is expanded and you don't know what is acceptable height for the patient, uh, except by taking serial x-rays, uh, which increases the x-ray dose to the patient. And um, still it's unclear, even if you control the height, it's unclear whether you fracture the end plates or not. Um, and some expandable T-lift cages claim to uh, torque out once it reaches a certain foot pound to expand and, and it claims to not break the end plate, but, uh, but this is a, it's, it's a set torque amount and, uh, and it's different for every single patient, especially those with uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis. So then what's the ideal T-lift? The ideal T-lift, is a cage that's placed very anterior to increase the uh, maximal disc height and foraminal height, as well as uh, increasing segmental lordosis. 
And uh, the ideal telic cage is, is a banana cage, uh, which Travis showed. It's, uh, and the theory is that the vertebral body is wider than its uh, AP diameter. So putting in a longitudinal cage uh, gives you better surface area and you can place a much larger cage. And um, it also allows the fulcrum to be as anterior as possible to increase segmental lordosis and allows a larger cage to be inserted uh, for fusion. And so this is what it looks like an, articul an articulating static t lip cage where it's inserted in an oblique fashion and then the arm is released and, um, uh, and then it's, sorry, my phone just dropped. The arm is released and the, um, uh, and it, the cage is uh, uh, tamped in even deeper to get as anterior as possible and to go across the contralateral disc space. Uh, but almost every expandable t lift cage is actually a bullet cage, meaning that it goes in straight and it does not turn and, uh, and it expands in, in, in one direction, uh, except for the flare hawk, which does expand side to side as well. Uh, but there's only one articulating expandable t lift cage, and I won't mention which company makes it. Uh, and, how, and then the, the next point is that, you, like Travis had mentioned, uh, you get very poor bony packing in expandable cages. If you look at the flare hawk uh, on the top right, you can see that very little bone graft can be placed within the graft itself. And even once expanded, what little bone graft you are able to place in the, in the graft is now even further apart from the end plates uh, because of the expansile uh, mechanism. Uh, these instrumentation companies claim that you can backpack the graft. However, you can't backpack bone chips into a... Uh, into a, uh, a fixed space, you can only really uh, insert uh, DBM or, or demineralized bone matrix putty, which is not the ideal surface or ideal uh, medium for bony fusion. Uh, still, and, and it still doesn't solve the issue of uh, expansile mechanism of the expansile mechanism inhibiting uh, bony growth through the uh, through the graft. But if you look at the bottom right and you see the static cages, uh, it's a wide open channel. Uh, you can stuff way more bone graft in there. And it uh, allows for bony growth through the uh, through the cage. Um, and this is the same study that uh, that Travis showed. But there's really no difference in pelvic parameters, even though um, expandable cages initially have better uh, segmental lordosis. Um, but it, the overall pelvic parameters, the lumbar pelvic parameters, don't change. There's no difference in operative time or blood loss. There's no change in patient reported outcomes in terms of relief or radiculopathy. Uh, and one argument that MIS surgeons will use is that expandable cages are better for MIS because you have a smaller window to operate, but instrumentation companies have actually developed um, MIS uh, screw distraction systems to widen the foramen, like this uh, system by Nuvasiv, uh, obsoleting the need for an expandable cage, and you can now take advantage of the, uh, all the benefits of using a static cage. And also in resident education, if you only know how to place an expandable, you don't necessarily know how to place a static cage because you need to understand how to maximally expand Camden's triangle to accept that larger static cage. Um, you have to learn how to distract across the screws with a lamina to increase the disc height instead of relying on the expansile mechanism alone. However, if you know how to place a static cage, the access needed to place an expandable is actually less than a static cage so you so uh, you know how to place an expandable. Hospital costs static cages by comparison are far less expensive. Uh, expandable cages have higher costs due to the hospital uh, the expenses built into you know research and development of the um, expand expandable mechanism. And some of these cages can reach almost five figures per cage. And so if you're doing a two or three level T lift, it adds up uh, significantly. Uh, you know, I'm sure Travis's spine reps are very happy when uh, when he uses his expandables, but the hospital is not as happy. My final point is that Dr. Lanky, our, the father of modern deformity surgery, only uses 20 degree lordotic articulating static cages in all of his T lifts, regardless of the patient. Um, and he and he's a he's a firm believer in not using expandables. So, uh, so. <laughs> In conclusion, uh, static cages have lower rates of subsidence, a lower rates of adjacent segment disease, and which can subsequently uh, reduce the rates of revision surgery. There's no real difference in lumbar pelvic parameters. They have equal amounts of uh, um, leg pain relief, 
and operative time and blood loss, and there's no risk of cage collapse and lower hospital costs. So why not use static cages? All right. I think that's all I had for my argument for pro-static cages. That was great, guys. Thank you. Um, do we have any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, great presentations. I mean, uh, they they covered all the main arguments for for both sides. Um, what I would like to mention is, uh, you know, the subsidence issue um, uh, was was real for the expandable cases, but uh, that had to do with the fact that when you're um, rotating the instrument that, that expands the uh, the cage. Uh, the, the force really gets uh, amplified uh, in, in terms of how much force is applied to, to the end plate. And uh, when we start using these expandable cages, we, you know, we're not really aware of how uh, we thought that the force that we're feeling on the instrument was the force that was applied to into the end plate, which was not really uh, accurate. And um, that's uh, why I think, you know, in when we first started using these expandable cages, there was probably a higher incident of uh, subsidence because I think there was a microfracture happening at uh, the expansion phase interoperatively. Uh, but uh, once, uh, you know, we became aware of that, I personally, I don't think that there's a higher incidence of um, um, microfracturing and, and subsidence of the expandable cages. Uh, I think it was a very key observation and actually was communicated to me by uh, other surgeons. Any other questions from the audience? All right, well, maybe next, maybe for our next round, um, we have Alejandro and Jeff coming up in about a month. Maybe we'll have a vote at the end on uh, who won this, uh, who won the argument, but we'll defer that for this one. Nice job preparing your arguments, guys. And thank you everyone for your attention. Have a great day.